Hi everybody, Jacob Reed here from ReviewEcon.com. Today we're going to be talking about the loanable funds market. If after watching this video you still need a little more help, head over to ReviewEcon.com and pick up the total review booklet. It has everything you need to know to ace your microeconomics or macroeconomics exam. Let's get into the content. Now since the loanable funds market is a market, you already know it's going to have a demand and a supply curve. First, we're gonna talk about that demand curve. Now, the demand for loanable funds includes all borrowing within the economy, but for your exam, it's primarily going to be comprised of the investment demand. When we draw out the graph on the x-axis, we're going to have the quantity of loanable funds, and on that y-axis, we are going to have the real interest rate. You can abbreviate it as little r, as I have up there, or spell it out as the real interest rate. And the demand for loanable funds, as well as the investment demand curve, is downward sloping. That means we're going to have an inverse relationship between the real interest rate and the quantity of loans that are demanded to purchase physical capital. At high interest rates, we are going to have a low quantity of loanable funds, and at low interest rates, we will have a high quantity of investment demanded. Now, that investment demand curve does have some shifters. That investment demand curve will shift to the right or to the left for anything that would impact potential profit on new investments. If there's an increase in the economic outlook and businesses start to feel more confident in the future rate of return on their new investments, we're going to see a rightward shift of that demand curve. Investment tax credits from the government can also shift that investment demand curve to the right when we decrease those taxes and to the left when we increase those taxes. Investment tax credits lower taxes for businesses that purchase physical capital. We also have corporate income taxes Decreasing those will increase the profit potential for new investments, shifting that demand curve to the right. Also, changes in productivity for new physical capital will also shift that demand curve. And rising real GDP can increase profit potential moving forward, and that can shift that investment demand curve as well. So if the profit potential for new investments increases, we're going to see a rightward shift of that investment demand curve. And when the profit potential of new investments decreases, we will see a leftward shift of that investment demand curve. And that means that at any real interest rate, businesses are going to borrow fewer funds to purchase physical capital. So next we're gonna talk about the supply curve within the loanable funds market. We call the supply curve the savings supply. And that's because when most people save their money, they put it in banks, and that money is then made available for loans. The savings supply curve is going to be upward sloping, and that's because there's a direct relationship between the real interest rate and the quantity of loanable funds that people save. When interest rates are low, people save less, and when interest rates are high, people save more. Now, of course, the supply curve can shift, and those supply shifters include anything that will change the amount of money saved in United States banks. Changes in consumer disposable income will impact how much consumers have available to save, if consumers have more disposable income, they will save more, shifting that supply curve to the right. Less disposable income will mean a decrease in the savings supply, shifting it to the left. Changes in the national savings rate will also shift that supply curve to the right or to the left, depending on if it's an increase or a decrease. The economic outlook can also impact how much is saved. When things are looking good within the economy, consumers actually save less, and that will decrease the supply of loanable funds. When the economy looks like it's going to be doing poorly, saving supplies actually increase. But the saving supply isn't just comprised of US citizens that save their money in banks. It also includes foreign direct investment. People in other countries often seek high interest rates they can get within United States banks. When foreign investment, really savings, flow into our banks, we call that a capital inflow. And when foreign investors pull their money out of US banks, we call that an outflow. Inflows increase the supply and outflows decrease the supply of loanable funds. You'll learn more about capital inflows and outflows in Unit 6. And of course, political or economic stability can impact how much foreign investors would like to put in U.S. banks. If there is political instability within a country, there will be a capital outflow as foreign investors pull their money out of those banks. Likewise, if foreign investors expect a recession, they are likely to withdraw money from those banks as well decreasing the supply of loanable funds. Increases in the supply of loanable funds are going to shift it to the right, and decreases in the supply of loanable funds is going to shift it to the left. These supply and demand curves function just like the supply and demand curves you've already learned about in this class. Now we're going to put the supply and demand curves together on the same graph and get the loanable funds market. 
And when we do that, we are going to get the loanable funds equilibrium. Let's go ahead and put our graph here. And this time on that y-axis, I'm actually spelling out the real interest rate all together there with my abbreviation of R little e as the equilibrium real interest rate and QE down there on that x-axis being the equilibrium quantity of loanable funds. When the real interest rate is below equilibrium, that will give us a shortage of loanable funds. The quantity demanded is going to be much greater than the quantity supplied. And as a result, the real interest rate will increase towards equilibrium. And when the real interest rate is above equilibrium, that's going to give us a surplus of loanable funds. The quantity supplied is much larger than the quantity demanded at that high real interest rate. That surplus of loanable funds is going to cause the real interest rate to fall down to the equilibrium. Next, let's see how supply shifts can impact the real interest rate and quantity of investment. If there was an increase in the saving supply or a financial capital inflow from foreign investors putting their money in this country's banks, that's going to shift the supply of loanable funds to the right, decreasing the real interest rate and increasing the equilibrium quantity of loanable funds. That means we're going to have an increase in gross investment and that will increase the long run economic growth of this economy. If on the other hand, we had less savings or a financial capital outflow, then we are going to see a leftward shift of that saving supply curve. The real interest rate is going to increase and the equilibrium quantity of investment or loanable funds will decrease, causing less gross investment and decreasing the growth rate for this economy. When it comes to demand shifts, remember that anything that changes potential profit for future investment will shift that demand curve. If there's a decrease in business confidence, that's going to decrease investment demand, shifting it to the left, and that will cause a decrease in that real interest rate also decreasing the quantity of gross investment or loanable funds. If there's an increase in business confidence, then we're going to see an increase in the investment demand curve, shifting it to the right, which will increase the real interest rate and increase the quantity of investment or loanable funds. Now, just like we've seen in some of the other graphs in this class, we could also have double shifts here. Remember, if we have a double shift, then one of these axes is going to be indeterminate. Here we have our starting point right there. That's our first equilibrium. If we see a decrease in the investment demand curve, that's a shift to the left, that puts us at equilibrium point two, and we have a lower equilibrium quantity as well as a lower real interest rate. If we also have a decrease in the supply of loanable funds, that will put us at equilibrium point three right there. Since both shifts decrease the quantity, we know that the quantity is definitely going to decrease. That means that the real interest rate is going to be indeterminate. So a double shift like we see here is going to mean the quantity is going to decrease and the real interest rate will be indeterminate. If you see a double shift question, just graph it out and see what happens. If the two shifts increase and decrease one axis, that axis is indeterminate. If both shifts decrease it, then it for sure decreases. If both shifts increase it, then it for sure increases. Now, the last thing we're going to talk about is this thing called crowding out. Now, later on in this class, you will learn a little more in detail about crowding out, but crowding out does impact the loanable funds market. Crowding out is the idea that an increase in the government deficit, which increases government borrowing, is going to cause an increase in interest rates and a decrease in gross investment. Essentially, when the government deficit spends, it must borrow the funds in order to pay for that deficit spending. And there are two ways of showing that impact on the loanable funds market. You just need to pick one of them. One way to look at it is that the government is going to be borrowing money and demanding those funds alongside other businesses. And that means that the government is going to increase the demand for loanable funds, which increases the real interest rate and increases the quantity of loanable funds. However, be aware that in the end, this interest rate increase is actually decreasing the amount of private investment because at higher interest rates, businesses are going to borrow less. And as a result, they're purchasing less physical capital. The other way to look at it is to decrease the supply of loanable funds. Here, the government is not demanding loanable funds alongside businesses, but they are taking from the supply of loanable funds, leaving less private supply for businesses. This is the method I prefer because we see an increase in the real interest rate and a decrease in that equilibrium quantity of investment. And that's where we see the higher interest rate causing the lower amount of investment. I suggest you use the shift that your professor or teacher prefers. But either way, the real interest rate is going to increase, 
the quantity of actual investment is going to decrease regardless of what happens on that x-axis. If on the other hand we have a decrease in government borrowing, that's actually going to decrease the real interest rate and increase the amount of gross investment. We could decrease the demand here because the government is demanding fewer loans alongside businesses. That's going to decrease the real interest rate here and decrease the equilibrium quantity of loanable funds. But be aware, this is actually increasing the amount of investment within the economy. The other way to look at it is that the government is increasing the supply of loanable funds as they take less loans from the saving supply. And as a result, we see a decrease in the real interest rate and an increase in the quantity of loanable funds. Either way you look at it, a decrease in the deficit is going to decrease the real interest rate and increase the quantity of investment. Again, use the shift your teacher or professor prefers and you'll learn more about this in Unit 6. And there you have it. That is everything you need to know about the loanable funds market. If you still need more help, head over to ReviewEcon.com and play the loanable funds game to practice shifting and manipulating the loanable funds market. If you still need more help after that, pick up the Total Review booklet. It has everything you need to know to ace your microeconomics or macroeconomics exam. That's it for now. I'll see y'all next time.